what makes Ishiru great? He says, well, Ishiru is great. He says, but karate is great because it's a good way of life. And that was what he said. So I started training. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. You are listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 752. My guest today, Sensei Art Gully. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, and I founded Whistlekick because I love traditional martial arts in all forms, and all implementations, all reasons why training. And that's why we do all the things that we do. If you want to see all the things that we do, well, go to whistlekick.com. That's our online home. You're going to find all the things that we're working on, including some of the products that we release to monetize all the cool content stuff that we put out for free, like this show. You find something over there that you like, use the code podcast15. It'll save you 15%. Helps us on the back end and all is well. Now, if you want to go deeper on this or any other episode of the show, because they're all available for free, no paywall, nothing like that. We don't take them down at any point. Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You're going to find all kinds of cool stuff over there. Photos, videos, links, even transcripts of past episodes. So you can dig deeper into what our guests say. We bring you two shows each and every week with the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining you, the traditional martial artists of the world. If you appreciate that, if that means something and you want to do something for us to help us continue doing what we're doing and expand our offerings, we've got a lot of options. You could tell people about what we're doing, share this episode with somebody, or you could buy something. You could leave a review, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever works for you, or consider joining our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. You can get in as little as two bucks a month, find out who's coming up on the show. It's the only place we release that information. And at the various tiers, we give you tons of value back, the kind of stuff that you're going to enjoy. And if you want the whole list, all the ways you can help us in our mission to connect, educate, and entertain, go to whistlekick.com slash family. You got to type it in. There's no link or anything. And if you do that, you're going to see a big, long list of things, stuff that takes a little bit of time, stuff that's really fast, stuff that costs you some money, stuff that is completely free. We appreciate each and every one of you and all the things that you do to help us make sure that we continue on our mission. I've been paying attention to today's guest for a while. I've enjoyed what he had to say. I've liked his videos on TikTok, but there was some stuff that he started putting out. And I said, you know what? This is a guy we need on the show. And so I reached out to Andrew and I said, check this guy out. What do you think? And he agreed. And that's how we got to here. Enjoy my conversation today with Sensei Art Gully. So how are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing very good. I'm really looking forward to this. This was very exciting. I've listened to a few of the episodes at work and it's like, wow, you guys are, you got, you run a great podcast. Thank so it was really, you. I was Thank really you. honored to, you know, anybody even wants to talk to me about anything. <laughs> well, I've been, I've been watching what you've been doing on TikTok for a while and um, you, you have convictions and you hold to them. Yeah. And you and I philosophically are fairly aligned. And, yeah. you know, I, I just, you know, we've got a platform and I'm trying to share it with people who are doing the right things for the right, re- seemingly for the right reasons. And you're on that list. So I said, yeah, Andrew, you. get thank art you. on the show. <laughs> we, uh, but, um, we can either, we can either kind of pause here and chat about what's going to happen, or we just kind of can kind of dive in depending on your comfort level. I'm a, I'm a master. Awesome. awesome. So, but, you know, we were supposed to adapt. It. So this is a good test of that. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Why'd you get started? Why did you start doing martial arts? I started when I was, I was young. I was an overweight kid. I was the only child. So I got picked on a bit and teased. So I wanted to learn how to fight. So some kids in the neighborhood, um, <laughs> this is funny. One of the guys is, you know, how that there's that one house that has 20 brothers and sisters. Oh, yeah. The younger brother, I think I was probably about maybe 10 or 11 at the time. The youngest brother was about seven or eight. He hit me with a rock. And so I like, you know, don't hit me with a rock. And I, I kind of got mad. I told him off. Well, his brothers all came over to the house and it was like four or five of them. And they're like, yeah, you know, don't be messing with our brother and blah, blah, blah. And one of them, the one that he was like maybe a couple years older than me, he just hit me in the head and it rocked my head. And I just got mad. And then I looked and I looked and I'm like, okay. I'm about to just get beat up. So I just said, yeah, okay. And I walked off. 
Well, the next day he came back down. He said, you know, my brother told me really, that was wrong what we did yesterday, man. He said, but I hit you hard and you didn't fall. So he said, what do you do? I'm like, I don't do anything. He said, well, I'm going to show you some moves. So he started showing me some boxing. And, so just like um, that, the, bu- the the bully flipped. Yeah. And was like, here, let me let me yeah. teach you, young Padawan. Because when he hit me, I didn't fall down. <laughs> All right. But he, he showed me some boxing. And then, of course, everybody was watching. You know, I'm, I'm really old. So we had the Kung Fu classics back in the day. Sure. All the Shaw Brother classics. So sure. everybody's watching that. But he had taken up some Taekwondo. He was showing me that. And he he's the one that started me with the nunchucks. And then later, one of my cousins started Taekwondo. So he started training me with some Taekwondo. As I got older, I asked my mom. She's like, no, I'm not paying for that. So this, um, when I turned 18, of course, I'm on my own. I went to, there's a Taekwondo school where they used to be here in Detroit. And I don't know if he was uh, international or what, but it was Master Kim. And he had all the ads in the in the phone books. And he's doing flying sidekicks and everything. So I was so excited. He'd been around years. I went in for an interview. I set it up. I went in to join. And, you know, he came and he showed me all these books with him doing flying kicks and this and that. And he says, we train you this and this. And I said, OK, well, this is great. How much is it? He says he told me this this really high number. I mean, I was 18 on my own at the time. And I said, oh, wow, that's um." I said, that's kind of pricey. I said, what do you have like any plans? And he says, OK, well, you can train one day a week and then you sweep the floors in the dojo. You know, and I was like, OK, well, can I think about it? And he said he jumped up. He says, you wasted my time. You don't want to train. Get out. So that was pretty much that was pretty much my intro. So I was feeling kind of bitter about that. So I went to uh, at the time I was taking classes at OCC and one of the gym electives was karate. So I took it and it was Shotokan under uh, he was a sensei at the time. um, Gottlieb. I cannot remember his name, but he really showed us the basics. And we learned the first kata hand showdown. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing. So I just really wanted to join, you know, but at the dojo where he was teaching it, I still couldn't afford it. But he taught me a very valuable lesson, which sort of sets the tone for my martial arts down the road. After the class, I got an A out the class and, you know, it was was great. I told him, I said, you know, I've made up my own little kata. Can I show it to you? And he says, oh, absolutely. So I did some little moves or whatever, and I thought I was doing something. When he got finished, he walked over to me and he looked at me and I said, what do you think? He says, I think you need to commit to really training so you can really understand. He said, because it's not about making up moves. And that was it. And Mm -hmm. so that stuck with me. So, you know, years, few years went by. It didn't hurt? Mm -mm. It okay. didn't make me upset. Okay, interesting. I, it made me think. I was like, wow. Because when he, the way he said it, because he said it so nicely, he said, I think you should really devote to learning real karate so you can know what you're doing. He says, because just putting a bunch of moves together, he said, that that's not real karate. Mm. And I was like, okay. And he was so pleasant. You know, I wish I could remember his first name. He was like the nicest man. Okay, now I think now he's like a six or seven because I saw a write-up on him in an article a couple of years back. But he was the nicest man. So a couple of years after that, I started working at uh, home weatherization here in Detroit. And um, <laughs> one of my coworkers, we would do, I was telling myself, yeah, man, I do a little Taekwondo. And he says, listen, man, you need to get in the Ishin room. You need to get in the Ishin room. And I was like, okay, dude, that's not like you sneezing. And he said, no, you need to get in the Ishin room. So we were weatherization techs. We would, in between houses, we would do little sparring and stuff. And he would always get right in my face. And I'm like, how are you doing? You know, because my kicks were pretty good and I was flexible. He says, you got to come to Davidson. You got to come meet Master Adams. You got to come to Home of the Warriors. So finally, I went down one day and I met um, Master um, Grandmaster Willie Adams. And I told him, I said, listen, I, I want to take karate. I said, I'm very clumsy. I said, I've got a little Taekwondo. I've got a little Shotokan. I don't. I said, I said, I'm not very flexible anymore because I, I, I was starting to get some injuries. And he says, listen, if you can walk up a flight of stairs, you can do it in room. And I said, okay. I said, well, what makes Ishinru? I said, what makes Ishinru great? He says, well, Ishinru is great. He says, but karate is great because it's a good way of life. And that was what he said. So I started training, and that was in let me see, ninety three. And I've just been Ishinru ever since. And I, I've been fortunate because I've been um, at the time when you first start out, you don't understand the lineage of what you're being handed, and you learn it over time. You know, of course, we learned the history. Uh, Grandmaster Shimabuku, Tetsuo Shimabuku, created the style. And I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Grandmaster Angie Uezu. He came to the school. But my first formal teacher was um, Master uh, Eugene Woods Jr. He was one of Master Adams' high dives. And so he ran the Davidson School. And I know I drove him crazy because I have OCD. So 
everything becomes an obsession. So I would just ask and I would ask and, I would, and he would show me stuff and he would show me stuff. But the one thing he always impressed upon was movement and principles. That's all. I mean, we learn how to fight. And Ishinru, I like because Ishinru is in your face. You know, everything. It's like it's a street fight. It's a hybrid of Shonru and Gojinru and some other stuff that I'm sure Master Shimabuku threw in there. But it's in your face. You know, our katas are not pretty. Our stances are more natural, which is good, you know, for people like me with issues. But as I learned, it was just principles, principles. And he would always say, it doesn't matter if you're not good today. If you just follow the principle of the movement, you will get good. If you keep practicing, if you throw that same punch over and over and over, you will get good. And that's basically what I've done over the years. So I've just been with them, um, with Master Adams, and I've been fortunate to train with uh, Master Adams has hundreds of black belts. Mm. So I've been fortunate enough to train with a lot of great people, you know, uh, Grandmaster uh, Mike Schaefer, uh, my Grandmaster Reggie Phillips, you know, and my one of what we we call him, I call him my second dad, is uh, Grandmaster Carl Martin out of Philly. Now, when I was a green belt, Master Woods put size in my hand. He said, I need you. You need something to do because you're driving me crazy. <laughs> in Ishinaru, at our school, you don't learn sign until you become a Shodai. So that in itself was a little, you know, but he put him in my hand and he showed me how to hold him. And he says, now go play with him. I'm not going to teach you nothing else. So that's what I started doing. But I started researching and looking up. I bought the Psy book at the time and I'm, I'm finding out how to do stuff and I'm, I'm, I'm sneaking in little questions. So by the time I became a black belt, I, my size, I was really good with him. So I started learning the kata. Well, we started traveling down. Uh, Master Martin used to be in Detroit, but he moved to Philly years before. He came up to visit. And so me and my buddy, uh, Fred George, who I have to mention, my brother from another mother, who's he's like, a, I think Fred's a six dime now, but we're just, you know, we were, we were, we were combat brothers. Sure. We started driving to Philly to train with Master Martin. And That's a he hike. trains old school. Hmm? Hot, Philly's a hike from where you were. Right. Well, it was 10 hour drive. Yeah, we did it in nine hours, 40 minutes. Uh, we would get in the caravan at five in the morning and we were supposed to share the drive. Fred would get in the caravan and fall asleep. So <laughs> I would, and once he fell asleep, that was it. I did it nonstop because that's just me. You know, we would, yeah. I would do <clears throat> about 100 miles an hour. We would stay a few days and the things we learned. I mean, the, the way he the, the, the katiki tie, the makiwara, the training, everything was just hardcore. Mm. But the side training. And it was just like, wow. So it's like our minds just expanded. So when we came back to Detroit, we would filter in that stuff. And anybody, if you give me something, I'm a sponge. You know, one of the things I really stress when I do my videos is that it's not about which style is better. It's not about which discipline is better. It's about your understanding of the principles of that discipline. So if you show me a punch and you can explain the principles behind it, and they don't violate the mechanics of body and physics, I'm going to learn that and adapt it because that's what true karate is. You know, it's it's a continual evolution. If you look at some of the old videos of Master Shimabuku in the 50s, you know, they're grainy and stuff. When you watch him do Akata, you watch him do Seisan, and then you look at us, how it's taught now. I mean, there's tons of differences. Because Are, are, are you talking it, about the drunk video? Uh-uh, not the one. Not, not the one not that one? drunk. Not the one when he was at the uh, Agenda <laughs> Dojo with, uh, I mean, at the Dojo with Master That's Armstrong. the only one I've seen is the drunk one. You've got, they've got some of him actually in Okinawa. Oh, I, I got to check those and out. And they're oh. in black and white and he's younger. Okay. And it's like, wait a minute, what are you doing? Why are you sharing like that? He does one, he does Tokumini and, you know, he's doing it one handed with that bow a lot. And but then you watch later on and, you know, it evolves, it evolves, it evolves, it evolves. So one of the things I, I really, you know, this, this whole karate journey over almost 30 years is that the only thing that I've learned is that I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. You know, every day I learn something new and it's like, oh, I don't understand that. OK, now I get it. Then I realize, oh, but if I get this now, I've got to get that. And to me, that's what martial arts is about. It's about continuing to improve yourself mentally, physically, spiritually. But it's about understanding what the human body can do. There's a reason the grandmasters created this, 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 this killing. And uh, karate is, let's just face it, it's about maiming and killing. Okay. Sure. The Okinawan Te, original Te, was about survival. The Japanese, they put the spirituality into it. The Americans, when they came back, they put the, the regiment and all of that. But karate is about survival. There's a reason these moves were created. 
You know, there's a reason Bodhidharma showed the monks what to do. There's a reason the Shaolin techniques have endured. If you understand the reasons behind it, the principles behind it, you can't beat anyone. You can be effective. And that's what I try to put on my TikToks, you know. Now, originally, <laughs> I started TikTok to promote my music. <laughs> Seriously, I to, I, I've, ne- I mean, I've never seen any of your videos pop up with music. Yeah, all my <laughs> videos that have music in it, that's my music. It's a real, oh, I, I didn't know. Every video that has music in it, it's my music because my okay. music is published. And so it's, it's a sound on TikTok. I didn't know my company did that until I was looking through TikTok. I said, hey, that's my song. <laughs> and then I looked at my contract and they're like, well, I called and said, yeah, you, you're on all the platforms. So I would do like little videos with me driving down the street and showing, doing music. I did one. I've got a couple songs where I actually sing. Most of it's all instrumentals, jazz, new age, but no views. So then I started doing silly stuff, doing my little voice imitations and comedies, you know, my little series, you know, it's wrong series and, and Flex Morgan series, no views. I did a video where all I did was a Karamba tutorial. Mm -hmm. It went viral. Mm -hmm. It was 45 seconds long. I do not speak in it. I show the trainer and I flashed, I, I you know, put the words up. It went viral. So then I did another video where I did something martial arts. It did good. So I got frustrated and I was going to, I said, I'm leaving TikTok. Well, there's a, um, one of my TikTok friends, uh, his name is, uh, his martial arts tag is, is Das. At, uh, he's a Kempo stylist out of Ireland. And we would chat through the messenger. And he said, I haven't seen you. Where you been? I said, you know what? I'm, I'm sick of this. You know, I'm trying to get my music out there. And all I do is I put karate. It goes crazy. He says, well, put your music in the karate. So, you know, light bulb. So I yeah. told my wife and she's like, well, yeah, you're doing videos, right? You can put music in them, right? Put your music in the karate. So that's what I started doing. But then I realized as I was doing that, you start attracting more martial arts uh, content. And a lot of stuff I saw, I, w- I, I didn't like it because there's always... You're more generous than I am. The majority you know, of what well, I see. I, I, I know that we may have minors listening, so I, I'm going to couch my comments. I appreciate that. With diplomacy. I, it, was, it was, let's say, it was the things that animals are street, a lot of what I saw. Because everyone's focused on looking sweet and being bad and doing this, but you're not really showing anything. You're not teaching. I mean, TikTok is a great platform. It's a good opportunity. You can actually show somebody that may help them. If I get up and show you a killing move, only thing that's going to do is set you up to either get hurt or Mm -hmm. hurt someone because you don't understand a principle. But if I show you how to move two feet by shifting your weight and sliding and using your center, now that's going to help you every day in life. If you fall, you'll quickly correct yourself. If you're in sports, it'll help. And if you're doing a fighting style, you understand the principle of body mechanics. So I base, I started basing my platform on that. And then when I do demos of stuff, I try to put my music in. And I was like, please listen, please listen to my music. Go to Spotify. I'm on all the platforms. And that's basically, that's basically how I'm slowly gaining a lot of followers and it really, it, it, it touches me. It overwhelms me. I get so many messages from people saying, thank you for breaking this down or thank you for this. Mm-hmm. You know, I have one lady and I did a video because I, I, I had both my hips replaced last year. So, you know, you, you, you're limited. You can't walk. So I had to learn. I talked with sense. I said, look, I need to know what to do. So he would work over principles. And so I started showing stuff you could do if you got limited mobility. And this one lady, she said, you know, she had MS and she says, you know, I forgot that I can use my knees or I can move the way you and thank you for this. I had another guy. He's like, you know, I'm in a similar situation and it just really makes me feel good. It's like, OK, I'm putting stuff that I'm going through out there and it's helping people. And that's what karate to me, it's about it. You know, the whole spirit of martial arts. OK, yeah, we learn how to maim and kill so we can protect our loved ones, but we also learn how to heal and how to be healthy so we can protect ourselves and our loved ones. So this whole, um, when, 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 when you guys, when they sent me the email and I'm like, they want to talk to you, say, you guys want to talk to me. And I knew who you were. And he says, yeah, you know, Jeremy follows you. I was like, I follow him <laughs> because you used to put more stuff. And then I understand why you stopped because I remember the other video you put out about the, um, really, there's a phone ringing now, about the political aspects of TikTok. It's just, everybody's, hating on each other everybody's challenging each other everybody's saying this is garbage and that's garbage and 
and the trolls and and the algorithm rewards that right and so you see people and and there are people and you know offline we could we could talk about it i'm not gonna i you know i'm not gonna disparage people publicly but there are people who i followed initially and i loved their content and they found kind of similar to what was going on with you with your music very little engagement and so then they just started feeding the trolls Boom. because you're taking a comment you're replying to that comment with a video and tiktok's like oh that's exactly what we want that's you to do want. and they it creates this conflict. negative feedback loop yep. and so great people were just scraping the bottom i'm like i know you have more to offer yeah and so that's why i think you stand out because you've refused to do that there's one video in particular and it was I, I don't i don't want to get specific with it but there was a video where you essentially said i'm not going to come down to this level with you with with you throwing shade oh yeah okay you yeah. know the one i'm talking about and that yeah. it was when i saw that video i wrote i reached out to andrews i took a screenshot of yeah. your t- i was like get 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 art art needs to come on the show right now yeah. and you know and and that particular um that particular user offline you know because it, it was a situation where I overstepped. I'm not going to say I didn't. And that, that was what I said was thoughtless. But the response, I'm like, whoa, bro, I'm not coming down. It, it was, it was. Out of, yeah, it was. Out but of balance. We resolved it. And then Good. I said my apologies. He said it retracted it. We resolved it. And now it's like we built a friendship based Good. on, OK, you know what? You were right. I, I went a little too far. It triggered me. Thank you for telling me. Thank you for apologizing. And you were right. And it's like I can work with that. I had a guy once. Um. He he put a really negative comment on one of my videos. And so I asked him, I said, well, what would make you say that? It was in terms of movement. And he says, well, I'm such and such and such of this. So we had dialogue for several you know, things back and forth. And then he's like, you know what? I actually understand what you're saying. So he became a follower. And now he often comments on my video. He doesn't post anything, but he'll post. He'll say, hey, I've noticed such and such. Keep up the good work. See, that's what to me, it's OK if you want to question what I'm doing. I get that. But if you're going to come out with outright negativity, when I see a negative comment, the first thing I do, which we all do, I look at the user. Okay, you're making a negative comment. You've got no content. Yeah. So whatever, bro, you know, but it's not if I take that energy to respond to that, then I'm cheating myself. I'm I'm that being true to me. I'm going to say, okay, this is negative. What do they say? If, you, if everybody talking about you, you're doing something right, you know? What's the first thing since they teach you in a fight? Walk away. Because walk away because I know one of us is not coming home. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake. I take my karate very seriously. If we get into it, I'm going home because especially now the new Game of Thrones is coming. So I got to go home, (laughs) which means one of us has to die and it's going to be you, which is why I train. I don't train for tournaments. I don't train for sport. I don't do none of that. I train hardcore. Now, when I'm in the dojo, I have to couch everything since they tells us that, but every move and he teaches us these moves can instantly become lethal. It's about killing and maiming. So I'm not going to waste that energy engaging with people over the keyboards and, and you see folks. And it's sad because I see so many good martial artists who had something to offer. And like you said, all they do is do troll response videos. And I don't understand. And it's like, why are you even bothered? Especially some of these guys who are high dots. When you're seventh, eighth, I mean, you're supposed to know better, in my opinion. I I agree. But, I, you know, I think it's proof that ego exists. Yeah. And, you know, depending on where you're at in life, in the world, putting yeah. out a video that gets a lot of attention can make you feel good. There's a dopamine response. You know, there all is. these apps, they, they know. They know exactly what they're doing to us. It's and they know how to trigger you. Yeah. And it's sad because when you, you know, people say, why is the world in the state that it is? Well, that's reason because chaos feeds the masses, especially with now with 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 the covid and everything. People are looking for that that escape and 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 and, and the quick fix. Chaos is the quick fix. It gives you the adrenaline rush, it gives mm-hmm. you the whatever. And I don't know. I always say as martial artists, we are supposed to rise above it. I don't care what your discipline is. I don't care what your martial, what your style is. If you are a true martial artist, I did a video about that. Are you a martial artist or someone who practices martial arts? Mm-hmm. If you're a martial artist, you're going to subscribe to the codes, the principles. You're going to understand Bushido. You're going to 
walk a higher road because you know what it could lead to if you don't. You know, you look at Achilles shield in ancient times. The reason he had the gardens on his shield is because I'm fighting this war so I can get to the garden. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? If I go down this road with you, it's going to end badly. I'm training so that it will end badly. I don't want to do that. So that I'm going to keep myself back because I know the results. I know the consequences of my actions. And that's one of the things that I find that like the platform like TikTok, it's feeding the the other end of that spectrum. You know, it's 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 showing I think it's irresponsible if you show a specific move that will hurt someone and you do it detail and you put it out there. And then some idiot is going to learn it. Yeah. And they're going to hurt somebody. Are they gonna, I think that's very irresponsible. I mean, video I put out there, one of the things, especially when I, I did a both series, because I, I just, I get tired of seeing everyone do amazing stuff. And then no one, if you don't know how to start, people are going to get hurt. Yep. You're going to get hurt. If you do not know how to properly hold a karambit, you are going to slice your hand off. Okay. Yes. If you do not know how to properly hold and turn that bow, you're going to clock yourself in the head. You're going to hit, kill yourself or hurt yourself. So you show all this fancy stuff and then what? So it's like, no, I'm going to show you, hold the ball and you do this. That's it. And then you do that. And then I always say, if you truly want to learn, you seek a qualified institution or teacher. Qualified. I always put qualified. Not a McDojo. But you seek a qualified institution because to me, it's important. I want to whet your appetite. I want to show you some true karate. I want to show you some, some of my art. But I want to show you just enough to make you curious so that if you want to go deeper, then you will seek that knowledge because that's the journey. That's part of the responsibility. It's like if I want something, I got to go get it. It's like when you want that 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 20 ounce porterhouse that only that place 15 miles away, you'll drive to get it. That's the dedication. If you want the true training, the true understanding, if you want the true totality of it, you're going to seek that training. And that's something I think that as martial artists, as senseis, we really should start pushing, okay? If you want to learn, find a qualified teacher. I, myself, I have a problem. There are a lot of online, you know, schools. I don't have a problem if you're in an online class, one-on-one or three-on-one with the sensei and you are, you know, I love that. Video conference, I love Mm -hmm. that. I do have a problem when people just throw out a YouTube video And this is the move. And so you learn that and you're thinking, okay, now I know karate. There was no interaction. There's no explanation of the principle. There's no explanation of the basis behind it. There's no history behind it. And that's what's happening a lot. You know, let me let me play devil's advocate. I I actually I'm. We're not in complete agreement, but I'm more in agreement with you than I am in disagreement. But let me play devil's advocate just for the sake of conversation. Definitely. If we think of a. First week white belt. Okay. That's kind of what you're doing though, isn't it? You're you're not teaching them depth of a technique. You're 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 teaching them something they're going to get it wrong. Oh, definitely. They're going to screw it up and they're you know, if there's a point in martial arts training where someone's going to take what they've quote learned and take it out on the street and get themselves hurt, it's in that early time before it's really been drilled into their head. This is, you know, walk away first, etc. So how is it different? How is the the video different from those first couple of classes? Because the video is different. The first couple of classes, you said it right there. The first couple classes, you're building upon the foundation. You come to me on Monday, I showed you how to punch and block. You come to me on Tuesday, I show you the same punch and block and we talk about why you should do this. You come to me on Wednesday, I show you the same punch and block and we talk about why you should do this and why you shouldn't do this. I put up a video of day one. I do a day one video, but then I don't any. I don't do any follow up. So you're getting the first bite of that sandwich, and you're not getting the rest of the meal. Mm-hmm. So now you're trying to survive on that one bite. You're trying to make it through your week on one bite of the sandwich, whereas the rest of you is starving because the rest of the meal is left behind. It wasn't given to you. It wasn't presented to you. That's why I say now when if it's when like there are online courses where when they charge and they should, where they give you step by step, that's fine. But I have a problem when if you start something, you put a little bit of something out there 
and then you walk away from it. Well, you got all these people clamoring for it yeah. and you haven't given them anything. You know, if I would do a series, you know, like I, I did, I'm doing the the one, <laughs> the Karamba in the car, I was bored. And so, <laughs> I, and I said, I'm going to do, because you should be able to work your weapons in the car. Anything could happen. You should be able to work your weapons. What about so Bo? I was picking my son up you, from work. You going to do Bo in the car? I'm not going to do Bo in the car. I think you should. There, I there think there's some practicalities. I, I think you, you roll down the windows and I think you do Bo in the car. I'm telling you, I think people, there you go. There you go. You've got until this comes out before somebody I else steals that idea. Bow in, I might do bow in the car just because I'm going to everybody, just because Jeremy said. <laughs> but you know what? If I do that, you know what will happen? If I do that, you will have someone sticking their bow out the car and it will be a new thing to drive by as close as you can and hit a pedestrian. It's called jousting. Yeah, no, They've that's been doing it. that for hundreds of years. Yeah, but it'll be a pedestrian that has no idea. Just somebody you don't like. You know, uh, this is this is this is the world I, of Karen. I hate that I see your point. You have to. I do. You, you got to yeah. walk the moral high ground. You have to walk it because not everyone's going to walk it with you. No, you know, not everyone's going to walk it with you, but it doesn't matter what anyone else says. It's what you say. I know that if I show that someone could potentially be hurt, so I'm not going to show that. Although I might do cane in the car. But anyway, <laughs> but it's like. When you when you do something, so I, I did the karambit. I said first I start off get the trainer, get the trainer. If you don't have a trainer, tape your blade up with painter's tape. First move this and that. First move work that. Then I'll come back. The next video I add it to it. And on the final okay, on the final video, this is the complete sequence. This is just a beginner sequence. So mm -hmm. what I did is took you from day one. Each day I tell you get a trainer. I reinforce that. I tell you practice slowly and safely. I reinforce that. I constantly, for five or six videos, you're being basically that first week of class. Yeah. And I end it on something that's a complete boom. You know, like you go to karate, you get the first 10 basics. If you quit, you've got 10 basics. And like Master Adams says, if you can master your basics, you can be any man walking in the world because mm -hmm. everything is about the basics. Now, whether you choose to practice them, it is on you, but I have given you 10 basics, the reasons behind them, and I've given you a foundation of do not go out and start a fight because I'm constantly telling you that. But I don't like on the flip side of that, if I come out and show you the punch and then I don't make any follow up. So you've got this punch. You don't really know what to do with this punch. But then you go and hit somebody with this punch. I haven't told you do not hit people with this punch. I haven't told you this is very dangerous. I haven't told you you must practice slowly. And, you know, even if you don't hurt anybody, you go to punch and you break your hand. You know, yeah. I did a video that went kind of viral. All I did was show the Ishimaru fish. I stuck my hand up, closed my fist and said why we did it. People went crazy on it. Yeah. And then I had a guy, it was a really good dialogue with a guy. And he says, well, it looks like your thumb's going to get broke. Why do you do that? So then I did a video explaining why it's done. And it was so cool because he says, you know what? We actually have a fist similar to that in our system. And I thought that was amazing. I said, see, that's what I mean. That's the positive side of TikTok. You know, now, if I had responded with, well, blah, blah, I would have missed out on that exchange. You don't know what you're talking about. Come to my school and I'll show you. Oh, please. Let's not <laughs> let's not go there. Oh, I hear that so many times. You know, I, I had a, a friend of mine. He's um, this guy. He's a wrestler and a big guy, too. And uh, it's when you look at him. He, he's he's like a uh, he just is like a nice teddy bear, you yeah. know. He he moves at a nice even pace, but he does these these rolls and these tucks. And he was asking me, he said, you know, you should do a video showing your style versus this, and your style versus that. And I'm like, I don't want to do that because that's pointless. Because since I Master Adams always says this, and I, I want this to go international, he always says this. This is the one, the one concept of martial arts that should drive you. This is the one truth. That should outweigh everything else. And that is when you train in karate, when you train in martial arts, on any given day, you can beat anybody in the world. But on any given day, anybody in the world can beat you. So you've got to train for the eventuality. He drills that into us. So it's like, I can't say that, you know, I see a lot of guys, they, they're comparing the jujitsu with the, the traditional martial arts, with the MMA, with the boxing. You get anyone who is a dedicated practitioner in any of those styles, they're going to be a very difficult opponent. Mm -hmm. So you've got to follow your principles. You know what I'm saying? Did you ever watch um, 
Jet Li's remake of Fist of Fury, the the, the Fist of Legend. If you ever, yes, ever watched that, it's been a while. There's a scene I know you're going to remember it when the old Japanese master comes to challenge him, and they go out into the wilderness, and they start uh, fighting, and and Jet Li starts you know bouncing, and the master's like, "What are you doing?" And so he starts asking him questions, mm-hmm. and he's throwing them off, and he's explaining this and this and this and that. So there's a point when they're fighting and Jet Li's tagging them. So the master keeps looking. So then he starts doing the same thing. And it's like he quickly took what he saw, adapted it, and still kept his principles, but mm-hmm. added to it. I, I think that's that's a really good scene. And they, they don't they don't overplay it because Jet kind of smiles at him and then they just go at it. But I like that. And he says, you beat me. And he says, no, I didn't. What I did was I took what you had and adapted it to my principles. You know, and that's what karate is about, what martial arts is about, you know. But this stuff we got now, whereas everybody wants to be the best and everybody wants to be, who cares which one is better? You know, on Okinawa, the great masters, they didn't, there was no styles on Okinawa until the Japanese came and they said, you're going to have to formulate styles because when we bring our representatives, it needs to be organized. There was no styles. There was this man training, this man training, that man training. Let's get together. And, oh, I like what you're doing. Oh, I like what you're doing. That's why if you look at the Kata's, everything looks the same. Because they traded in exchange. Let's face it. There's only so many ways you can throw a punch because the human hand is only going to align itself in so many ways. That's right. So it doesn't matter if I'm going and I'm coming and coming. If the end result is the same, maybe you should find out why this works and adapt it to yours, you know? Follow the principles. And that's, I don't know, I guess that 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 gets me heated because I think I, the, the I, majority so of the people, the majority of the people out there who are are hell bent on figuring out, you know, this is better than this, and this person is better than that person, and everything. One, they barely train, if at all. Mm-hmm. Number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, it's coming from a place of fear. They're afraid of training in the quote wrong thing and wasting their time. And it's exactly. the same, it's the same reason that we've got, you know, the the pre the, the older generation of martial artists, and they were hell bent on this school is better, I'm better, that person sucks, because it for them to acknowledge that there was even some information that would have enhanced what they were doing, it meant they could have been better. They could be better than they are, and their ego can't handle that. Yeah. And I think it goes back to what you said before, ego. If your ego won't accept, you know, uh, Grandmaster Adams, he's, he's a 10th now, all right, and one of the foremost masters in the world. And you know what he says? He says, every day I'm learning. Every day I'm learning. This man is the epitome. As far as I'm concerned, this man can walk on water. I've seen him do it. No, let me, let me stop <laughs> it. But he, he, he's one of the most amazing martial artists and movements you will ever find. And every day he says, I got to keep practicing. I got to keep practicing. Every day I'm learning. So now I'm teaching you. So every day I'm learning. And that's the, that, that mentality that we're, we're missing. And I think you're right. You know, if you're so afraid to step out of your comfort zone or you're so afraid, if you got to a point why are you afraid that something might be better than you? There's always going to be somebody better than you. So why don't you learn from them? What did Qui-Gon said in Star Wars? There's always a bigger fish. Right. There's always a faster kicker. There's always a faster puncher. So you better learn how to be a better mover or you better work your sign chin so you can learn how to be a better punch absorption, you know, because that's the whole essence. And let me ask your opinion on this because this is sure. a topic that really, that kind of bugs me. There's a really great disdain for katas. There's so much in people who know, don't understand the point negativity of katas. You know, what, yeah. what's your how do you weigh in on katas? How do you in terms of the, what, what, what significance do you place on the katas? I, I, I used to have a longer speech on this and it became a speech because I was confronted with so many people who had come to me about it. And I would say and so here's the here's the latest iteration. You recognize the purpose, the, the, the value of practicing on your own. Yeah. Okay. So you're trying to become a better martial artist. Yeah. So you want to become stronger and faster and more flexible and better timing and and build all these things. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
wouldn't it be really cool if you could do all of those things kind of at once? Yeah, that's cut. Exactly. That's forms. Mm -hmm. If if you're practicing forms without any intent or any focus mm -hmm. on any, you know, kind of physical principle, it is a waste of time. Yeah. But you can practice forms with really deep stances and strengthen your legs. You can practice that same form and go through it as quickly as possible and improve your speed. You can take San Shin principle and apply it to any form and come through and be physically exhausted and build your strength, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the key. And I think a lot of people which um, you, you get down on it is because, you know, Bruce Lee, who was considered by some the greatest, you know, and the man was phenomenal. He mm -hmm. was. He, you know, he had to just, he, he took away katas and he felt that it was unnecessary. And that's fine if that's your opinion, but you learned katas first and then you transitioned into your style. You know, mm -hmm. you took from everything. And it's funny, I, I, what it really cracks me up is he, he developed a lot of combinations and like you go through the Jeet Kune Do book and it's like the man's mind was phenomenal. Uh, it's a shame he, he, he left so soon. I would have loved to continue his contributions, but if you watch his older videos and he's doing specific movements, he does the same specific sets. Like, dude, that's what a kata is. Yeah. He took his basic moves, which were from 15 different things and combined them into certain sets. Okay. That's just what a kata is. When you look at boxers and they're working combinations and they'll put three or four different combinations together into a sequence, that's a kata. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do boxers, you see them, they go slow with it. They go fast with it. They go soft with it. They go hard with it. Still a kata. Everything, mirror, all a kata backwards. is, is a series of movements put together. That's mm -hmm. all it is. You know, when I had the, um, before I had the hip surgery, I really couldn't walk that good because that was bone on bone and I was putting it off. I've been taking care of my mom's and um, I would still try to go to the dojo and sensei would laugh. One of the senseis just called me hop along. <laughs> but I was on the mat with one of the guys and I said, let's move around a bit. So he was coming in, doing all the stuff. And, and I kept hitting him. He's like, he would stop. He says, wait a minute. That's out of one, too. I'm like, yeah. I said, you have to understand when you think kata, you're thinking this traditional, formal. It's not. Then you think fight. This it, you can't separate the two. You got to do your katas. You got to see that person coming at you and you have to learn. Now, if I'm in the street and I got to move that way. All right. Well, Wansu teaches me the evasion principle and it also teaches me to square up on that angle so I can still maximize my power. But it teaches me to lock in place. So if I practice that real fast on the punching bag, it doesn't look like a kata anymore mm -hmm. because I'm doing it so fast. But if I slow it down, you're seeing that it comes right out of the kata. And that's the one thing, you know, Sensei always says that he's like. You can be an amazing fighter, but you're going to get old and you're going to get injured. But if you're a great kata man, he says, why do you think that you see these 80, 90 year old masters who will kill you because they're great kata men, because they have mastered the principles of the kata. It's not so much what the, the technique it's the principles behind the technique. Yeah. And yeah. I, I I like your I like your your thing though. You should do a video about that. <laughs> you know, you should say, "Hey, you want to learn how to do this? Yeah, you want to learn how to do this? Yeah, you want to learn this? Yeah, do your katas." And then everybody go, oh, but, but they great. don't want to do their forms because no. they aren't willing to put enough in that they enjoy them, mm -hmm. and so they find it boring. So they try right. to logic in reasons why they don't want to do something that they find boring, right? You know, it's like it, back work. I tell everybody, if you want to be an effective, I don't mean sports fighter. If you want to be an effective fighter, someone that's going to survive, you've got to put in back work because you need to know what it feels like to hit something. Because punching air, I'm amazing when I punch air. I've, but, I've never but, lost punching the air. Oh, man. Shoot. I've beaten like five or six air opponents at the same time just by looking at them. But you have to punch the bag. I see. It's like, it's not just all or nothing. You know, you got to practice your breathing because mm -hmm. if you get winded while you're fighting, if you don't know how to breathe properly. Well, one, you got too much air in your body. So when you get hit, you're locked up. Now you're done. Mm -hmm. So you got to know the proper inhalation. You got to know how to oxygenate your blood. You got to know where your tongue goes when you breathe. You practice that in your katas. Once you master that, then you go work it on the bag. 
because now you're getting the shock and impact and that's going to change the dynamic of that breath because now you've got to absorb the kinetic energy of it. And it's like, oh, wait, oh, great. So then you do your cardio. Because again, if you ain't got no gas, car's not going to go. So it's like everyone's trying to generalize, generalize, generalize. You know, if you've got a good hand game, you need a good kicking game. Mm -hmm. If you got a good kicking game, you learn you need a ground game because fights are going to the ground. OK, I love jujitsu. You know, I'm unable to really do much until I'm totally healed. But we've got a lot of grappling and we do a lot of crazy stuff that I'm like, I'm not ever going to do that in the street. But you never know. So learn. Right. But if I don't know how to, you know, a lot of the jujitsu guys, you know, you talk to some of the MMA guys, some of the best ones have a strong base in traditional martial arts. They have a strong base in boxing. They have a, and they combined it all into an effective form of fighting for a competition. Mm -hmm. But I guarantee you, a lot of these MMA guys, you take them out of that ring, they're still hardcore trainers. They know how to adapt. I hate when people say, oh, you just learn how to fight in the ring. No, if this guy is this amazing in the ring, how do you know what he's practicing for the street? You know what I'm saying? You can't discredit that. Just because I know some guys who are amazing tournament fighters, amazing tournament fighters. But you put them in the street, they get killed because in their mind, they never took it out of there. Bless you. You know, Thank they you. never they never made the transition. You know, right. we train for tournaments. But then you also train for the streets. Now, I train my sons and my wife. I don't train them for tournaments. They train they train for the streets because they're not going to come into the well, one son. He's a brown belt. My other son, he's like, I'm not coming in that dojo. So don't ask me no more. So I taught him some stuff. My other, I've got three sons and there's another one. He, he likes to do his basics and mm -hmm. he likes to fight. My wife, she says, I'm not coming to the dojo because I'm not bowing and I know I'll be kicked out. Mm -hmm. But we do a lot of bag work. We do a lot of grappling. We, you know, I sneak up on her to see what her reaction time is. I work on breathing and dynamic tension with her because she's, she's a lady. She's, she's a weaker sex, you mm -hmm. know, traditionally. So she needs to know about the body hardening, about the position. She needs to know about the nerve cluster. She needs to know these things. Whereas she's not going to come to the dojo and learn it. So I'll pick and choose. And, but they understand that it's all a combination of things. And when you're training, I was watching a video. This really grabbed me. There's a, a martial artist and um, uh, Scott Lawson. He's, um, he does a jujitsu and I'm really learning a lot of principles. He talks about principles, mm. but he put a great video out there and the people were saying, you know, that you don't train hard. You got on pads and this and that. And, uh, and, he, and he, I'm, he was just saying, basically, you got to train, you know, another uh, great guy, um, my friend Brian, he's at, uh, I got a, I'm, I got all these great TikTok friends at Southern Callus. He just did a great video about that same subject. And what I like about his is he says, you know, his whole comp, his whole topic was you do you. Why are you going to criticize someone who's training in pads because you don't train in pads? Why are you criticizing that? You know? What does it matter? You can't always train to the fullest extent because if you if every time you step into the ring to train, you're worried about getting hurt. You're not going to learn. Remember the the, the, the average pro Muay Thai career is something like two years. Yeah, yeah. You're not going to learn. You've got to. Sometimes you go hard. Sometimes you go fast. It's yin and yang. It's hard and soft. But his whole thing was basically you do you. He says, but if you disagree with me, we can fight. And I, I, I love the way he ended that because you got people who are just, oh, yeah, they got on pads. Oh, sissies, we don't use pads. Yeah, but you broke up. You can't walk. Your hands hurt. And every time you step in, your knowledge is going to be limited because you're not learning how to slip that punch. You're learning how to do whatever to keep from getting hit. So you're not learning the subtleties. So, yeah, you can keep from getting hit. But what about not even having a block? What about learning the movement within the movement? What about filling the void? If you're always going hard, you're never going to see all that stuff. You know, one of the things Master Woods used to always say is he was he is so fast. And he was like, I'm not as fast as you think I am. I just know how to move. Mm -hmm. Body efficiency, you know, and that's something that I I, I don't know. In, in your mind and um, when 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 you watch the the fighting and the, and, the, and, the, and the way martial arts going, everyone's you know, doing this thing and doing that thing. Why do you think 
Why do you think that traditional karate has basically become something that people find laughable or so people who are are so quick to disdain? Why do you think that that's that's that this transition's coming? Do you think it's because the MMA or I, I actually that? don't I I don't think it's as I still I still from from everything I see that we see as whistle kick traditional martial arts is is fine it's not going away but mm-hmm. you get a few people that are really committed to being loud to be disparaging because if you want the most efficient path to become to self defense it's not traditional martial arts Mm-mm. if you want the fastest path to being safe on the street, it's not joining a traditional karate, taekwondo, et cetera, school. It's not. There's a lot of other benefits, but it takes time. And so those people look at that and they're like, you know, I don't want to put the time in for whatever reason, but they've Mm -hmm. got to discount it in their mind in some way. So they don't have to consider it as an option. It's the same reason people look at what everybody else is doing and they need to cancel it because otherwise it could mean that there's something that they might have to put time into. They might have to become uncomfortable and go take some classes over here or a seminar over there to get better at something. Oh, but you know, uh, you know, they wear pads. So obviously they don't know what they're doing. I'm sorry. Show me any other physical pursuit with risk of injury where anybody is saying go a hundred percent all the time. It doesn't happen in any pro sports. They're always working on technique and drills. There is no subset that I'm aware of, of NFL players or NBA players saying, we drill 100%. Every practice is just games. That's all we do. We show up, we play games all the time. We never work on anything else. Why would that? It doesn't make sense in the context of martial arts. But the people who are out there saying these things, they don't have the context. They don't have the time training. They don't have the experience to actually understand what they're rejecting. It's the same yeah. way, you know, you, you've, I, I don't have kids, but I remember being a kid. You've got kids. Remember kids hit like 12 years old and pretty much anything that is not <laughs> their way or what they think is right is stupid and wrong. And you're dumb for doing it or believing it. It's that. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm living that now with having two 19 year olds and a 23 year old. Oh, buddy. But at some point in 10 years or so, all Mm -hmm. three of them are going to come to you and go, Dad, you were right. I'm sorry. You know, it's it's so funny. They do it now. Hmm. They do it now. And they'll they'll say, you know, you know, and I tell my wife because she, (laughs) you know, why is I love it? She's been putting up with me for 31 years. Okay. So. She'll be like, we got to do this. I said, ah, just back off. Let him, let him, let him mess up. When yeah. he realizes, he'll come back. And that some of the kids have been doing that, you know, but I, I, my boys, they really keep me humble. And um, the one thing that's funny, when you mentioned kids and we talk about ego, I think in a lot of ways, my kids keep my ego in check, mm. especially in terms of being a martial artist, especially knowing what I can do. My kids are not scared of me. They respect me. All I got to do is look at them. They're like, even now when we're like they'll I'll see the two boys, the twins are fine. I say, you guys, you want I say, can I join it? No, no, dad, no. I'm like, I'm not even going to, no. You, you hit too hard. I'm not even going to hit you. Yeah, but you'll do some move or something. <laughs> but one of the things that I, I used to, um, when like, like all martial artists, when you start karate, you may, for whatever reason, once you get bit by the tournament bug, it starts feeling pretty good to go out and do some katas and uh-huh. get to fight people. Well, I get, I, okay, I pay 25 bucks and I can hit somebody. Really? Really? And you win trophies and everything. And you, and you kind of get away from what you started for. And my oldest son, when he was, um, he was about four, you know, I had been training for quite a number of years. And I said, okay, you ready to, you know, start training the dojo? And he's like, yeah, I want to go to get to the dojo like you so I can do what you do. I said, oh, yeah, what is it I do? I thought he was going to say train and protect me and mom. He says, you go to tournaments, beat up people to win trophies. And I, it kind of like. How old was he? 
I went, what? He was like four at the time. Yeah. And I said, what, what, why do you do that? He said, well, dad, because you always training and you're training and then you, you go to these tournaments and you beat up people and then you come back with trophies. And I thought about that and I was like, ooh, is that what he sees? In my mind, he's seeing the great sensei. And all, but in his little eyes, he's saying, train hard, beat up people, win trophies so you know mm. you're good. So that night, I went and I gathered up all my little trophies and plaques and I threw them out. I just threw them out. I've never competed again. Mm. I just threw them out. I go to tournaments and I root people on. And if you need help, I will gladly work on it. But for me personally, with my personality the way it is, it's easy for me to get wrapped into the thrill of it. And that's not where I wanted to be with my training. That's not what I trained for. You know, I'm trying to be the best version of myself. So for me, that kept my ego in check. You know, when mm -hmm. I look in the mirror, I say, am I someone I'm proud of? True enough. But I'm someone my, my sons are proud of. You know, when I train, they know that they have to train hard. Or if when I'm doing something, they know that they have to work hard because I'm working hard. You know, so it keeps your ego in check. Now, on the flip side of that, we had our Ishinru Grand Nationals this year. And um, it was really nice. We had it last year, too, but it was a little bit more tense with the COVID going. Everybody's masked up and, you know, sparsed out. This year was a little bit more relaxed. I still had my mask on. I couldn't compete, but I was doing I always help out. And one of the rules at the beginning, since they gathers all the black belts, the primary rule for this tournament was the parents were going to be held accountable for interfering. It has become such a problem Ooh. with parents yeah. interfering with the match or yeah. they are so aggressive about their kid just winning that you got your kid in martial arts, but you want him to learn how to defend himself. You want him to learn humility. You want him to learn discipline. But you're basically showing him the very behavior that you don't want him to have. So he had to make it. I mean, it was a topic of discussion. It was Good. in the rules. If a parent spoke up out of turn, your kid loses a point. If you spoke again, two points. Third one, you're ejected. Now, what kind of world are we living in when it's becoming so prevalent that the parents, that the, 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 the win, the kill or be killed mentality is so strong that are you forgetting that this is just here so these kids can have fun and test their skills? You know, are you forgetting that it is OK to lose? Because if you never lose, you will never know how to win. If all you ever do is win, you will not know what true but life is. A lot is. of these parents After don't know how to lose. lose. They were they were raised on participation trophies and sports yeah. leagues that didn't have winners. Yeah. And I, I got a problem with participation trophies. You know, and I said we did a whole episode with me ranting against this. You know, he trophies. believes that students, if you try hard, you get a trophy. Now, the little, little kids, he says, the fact that they're brave enough to get out here, you're getting a little medal. Sure. And I, I have no problem with that. Yep. But the older ones, he's like, if you fight first through fourth place, OK, that's it. Sure. You just train harder next time. And I, I agree with that. You know, you reward them and you thank them for coming and you, you, you boost their confidence. But OK, you showed up to the tournament. Here's a trophy. Big old giant trophy. Uh, you know, I understand. It doesn't encourage the behavior that we all want to see. Confidence, but don't you, you know, I understand we want to, you never want to crush a kid. But at the same time, look at the young people of the world today. These young people are out of control. Yep. They're out of control. A lot of them are entitled. You know, their attitude, they think they, they, they own the world. They think they deserve everything. How did it get that way? Because basically you handed everything to them. When I was coming up, you had to earn that. You know, if I mm -hmm. wanted that toy, I had to say that allowance. I had to earn that. I had to do them chores, you know? You had to, you had to hold, be held accountable. Every aspect of life, there needs to be accountability. But if we're just giving you stuff, you don't get now, and not only that, you don't get a sense of accomplishment. It's the best feeling in the world when you doing no matter what it is martial arts cooking riding a bike you know even if you're a professional booger picker when you can pick that booger and flick it just so and you practice it hundreds of times and you've wasted hundreds of boxes of kleenex that is an amazing accomplishment you know what i mean but if you yeah. never put in that effort 
it won't matter to you. You're just blowing your nose. Oh, I don't care. I deserve to blow my nose. I deserve to flick boogers everywhere. Yeah. No. Yeah, I know that's gross, but you, <laughs> I've never heard that analogy before. <laughs> well, I always tell my kids that when they were growing up, I always tell them, I said, I don't care what you do in life. You got to do what you want to do in life. I want you to be educated. You must have an education, okay? Whether it's school or some kind of trade, you've got to be educated. And see, that's a misconception. Education does not necessarily mean books. We're in a, we're in a shortage of skilled tradesmen because society was sold on this thing that you've got to have a college degree in this. And then you've got thousands and thousands of college degrees who can't find a job where the infrastructure of the, of the country is collapsing because the tradesmen have just been evaporated, you know? And, so, and tradespeople can charge pretty much whatever they want and be as busy as they want. My plumber the just came in and replaced my bathroom faucet, the, the shower tub thing, the shower diverter broke. Yep. This is what he did. I told him, just bring me a piece. He came in, he checked it, he put his big wrench, he cracked the corrosion, unscrewed it, cleaned it, put the new one on, twisted it back, tested it perfect 10 minutes hundred dollars yep you can't walk in any job basically do that nope. so and i guess i guess the whole thing is i always tell them i said i understand you know i want you to get an education if you want to go to college great you're definitely going to go to college you're not going to sit at home you're going to work but if you're in school you're not going to work full time you know i came up man i was on my own since i was 18 you know basically and it was a struggle I got to the plant and you're making so much money. You, you forget. I went to school a little bit. Say, I forget it. Well, you flash forward 25 years and your body's broke down. You're frustrated with your job. You don't have any options. Education or trade, it just gives you options. And that's what I stress on them. And I tell them, I don't care what you do in life. And I, that's one of the analogies I use. I said, I don't care if you're a doctor, a lawyer, a professional booger picker. If you come to me, say, dad, I really want to get into these boogers, then we're going to research what nasal sprays you should be using. We're going to research the best hand sanitizers you can get, because at the end of the day, you have to live your life, you know? And if I'm up, a lot of times I get disappointed with some with their decisions because I don't understand them. But at the end of the day, it's like, it's still your life. I And I'll tell myself, okay, I don't agree with that. But if you research it and you feel this is what you must do, okay. And also, if you mess up, when these kids do stuff and they know they're going to, when they mess up and they come to me and say they mess up, the one thing I never say is, I told you, I always take a moment and say, okay, so what do we do now? Because they already know they messed up. The fact that you're coming to me tells me you know. So why am I going to debase you? You know, same thing with the training. You know, when I look at a lot of martial artists, I look at some dojos and I visit other dojos and stuff. And I always have a problem with yelling at the kids or debasing the student or, 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 or being super hypercritical. It's like you said, a white belt comes in and he's got three or four classes and you're just clamping down on him and crank him down on him. You're crushing his spirit. Like, dude, is that how you were trained? And if so, that's sad. Here's, here's one. You know, I, I believe firmly we encourage the behavior that we want people to take. You know, whatever motivation we give, whatever reinforcement we're giving, positive, negative, is going to dictate the behavior. It's been a rule in a lot of schools for a lot of years. If you show up late, you are punished. Mm -hmm. So what are we actually telling them? If you're going to be late, don't show up. Hmm. Yes. Don't we no. want them there? Mm -hmm. Right. Depends Don't on the, we, depends on the and, and there, there's a conversation to be had. Yes. Yeah. What, what I, I bring that up because it's a concrete example that happens in a lot of schools. Right. And if you're, if you're 16, if, if you're, if you're driving yourself and you're like, Oh, I'm going to be 10 minutes late. I don't want to get yelled at. I'm just going to not go. I'm going to mm -hmm. say I had a bunch of homework to do, but what do we want? We want them in the dojo. We want them training. We want them getting better. And all of our principles, our guidelines, our motivations should encourage training and progress. Much in the same way degree. that you tore, tore your plaques and trophies off the wall because it was... To a degree, though. Because you got to have checks and balances because you can also conversely influence that negative aspect. If I'm going to be a few minutes late and I'm going to get 
yelled at or whatever, I'm just not going to go. So now what you're saying is if there's ever a challenge, just forget it and do something else. You can no. indirectly influence that, but you can indirectly influence that negative behavior. If every time a child cries, you give them a toy to shut them up, you've indirectly influenced him. So now he's a teenager and you were like, why won't you? Because you, whereas if that child cries and you say, go ahead and cry, I'm not giving you what you want. But there's then a time. They realize it. There or is a time you to let him cry. Hand. And there's you know, a time there's to a time spank the hand. hand. There's a time to let and him, then there's a time to give him a okay, toy, you know right? What? I get it. Now I'm going to give you the tool. You you can't just have a single rule that applies. Yeah. You've got you've so got the kid who's late you, because the parent discipline. You've got the kid who's late because the parent was oh, distracted yeah. and got them there late. You gotta you've got the, the kid situation. who's late because they never get their stuff together on time. You've got the adult mm-hmm. who's late because they work three jobs to put food on the table, and sometimes they get mm-hmm. out a few minutes late because of whatever. Oh, Right. And so there are times when ru- when blanket rules, which are a lot easier. Don't work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a very slippery slope. Yeah. And that's that's something that I think that would be a good open forum for a lot of schools to get together and say, well, how do you deal with charges? Now, what Sensei does when I was coming up, if you were late. You get on the class, you get on, you do 10 push ups and you join class. That was it. You didn't get lambasted. You didn't mm-hmm. get dogs. Since they would talk to you in private, if it was becoming a situation, you may right. get pulled aside. Okay, I noticed you've been coming late. What's going on? Mm-hmm. Or he'll pull your parent. Okay, now I understand they're coming late. What's going on? Yep. It was always done in private. But as far as the public acknowledgement, hmm, excuse me, if you were late, you knew, oh, shoot, I'm late. You came right in, you changed up, you get on that mat, you do them 10 push ups on your knuckles, and then you join the class. And that was it. Now, I always thought that was great because you knew if I'm late, there's a consequence. But if I'm late and I have a reason, since they will listen to me and understand why I'm late, you know, and I thought that was always a great balance because there has to be consequences for tardiness and lateness. We have to instill that it is important to be on time because that's something that has to be ingrained. If you're scheduled for this and you just say, oh, I'm just going to blow that off. An ambulance driver, okay, we got to get there with less than five minutes, but we're not going to do it with the traffic. I just let them die. You know, I mean, I know that's an extreme, but you can see how that could easily spiral into that type of behavior. You have to be held accountable and you have to be have you have to have discipline. So I can say I do agree. You should not lambaste and dog and humiliate. I have never found humiliation to be an effective means of of humiliation is not an effective means of encouragement no. i just think that's not you don't get you know, the best out of people when you humiliate them. you know with you if they're automatically on the defensive i'm watching this show now it's um the chocolate wars or something and it's this master chef on there this guy he i mean this guy made a group out of a, a group out of chocolate nice. he is a master chef you know and what i like is when he's when he, when he comes to these people and they mess up he comes in and he'll look at it and he will point out what you did wrong, but he will also point out everything you did right. And then mm-hmm. he'll say, so the reason this happens is because you missed up this part. He says, so next time, let's try to take it back here. He said, but you did do this. And I love that because this guy is amazing. And if he wanted to, you know, like like Gordon Ramsay, I always hated that show. You yelling at people, but man, oh, I thought you hit a skillet, throw you a skillet at you. But I think that those in authority, if you're in a position, you've got to learn how to couch that criticism with a compliment. Yes, I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong, but I'm also going to tell you what you've done right. And nine Which, times out of ten, you're going to do ten things right and only one thing wrong. So, and both know. sides are. If you're if your goal, you know, I mean, we're we're here as martial artists. If the goal in raising a younger martial artist is to help them get better. They need both mm-hmm. sides. Here's what you're doing you right. Here's something that you could work on. Mm-hmm. Without that, ins- they just they stagnate. They do, and you see that you see that in the martial arts world, and it's unfortunately, especially like at tournaments where the coaches are going down and they're going hard on them. One of um one of my good friends, and he's uh he he runs Team Revolution uh, since a uh, Master Kyle Loveless. I love to watch him teach his kids. I go up to the school. He's really hard on them, like like strict but he's also like the most compassionate 
you know, because he'll say, he's like, this and this. All right. Okay, guys, hold on. Those kicks right there. Those kicks were so bad. Okay. Now, guys, I understand that you don't have energy. I understand you've been in school all day. I understand you just don't want to look at Sensei, but we got to get more spirit. He says, because what if I walk out and I got to hurt somebody? I got to protect myself. So don't you think we get them kicks right? So he flips that script. He acknowledges all the reason why you suck. And then he immediately, and it's like the the the, the response he gets to that. Is amazing because he shows you know? empathy. He understands, yeah. and, and and you know, I love I love to watch Master Adams teach a class, especially the little kids, because those kids they're all over the place. And I, I said, Sensei, how do you deal with them? Because I was showing the little kids something, and their foot was here. I said, Sensei, at what point? I said, are we shouldn't we be correct this? We can raise this. Okay, look, he said, this kid is six years old. He doesn't have the motor skills. He said, so if you show him the basic movement and just let him follow you along, follow you along, if he gets it right, compliment him. He said, as he grows, as his mind understands it, as he's built those neural pathways, all of a sudden he's going to realize, oh, hey, I know how to do that. He says, but if I just blast him right now at six, his little mind's going to shut down. He's gone. So I'm like, okay. He says, so correct them gently. Same thing with the adults. He said, these people, now, when we were younger, you know, Dave Davidson, we was hardcore, man. I ain't going to lie. We were hardcore. Master Woods used to always say, I don't, I don't send you to tournaments. I unleash you for tournaments. And that's how it was. But as we grew older, Master Adams, and, and, you know, he says, you have to evolve. He says, these are different times. He says, people are training for different reasons. He said, if you're coming to me and saying, I want to learn this martial arts and you're paying me your money, he said, it is my responsibility to give you a good facility and to make you feel welcome so that you will learn. He said, if every time you walk in the door, you're getting pounded and pounded and pounded. Now you're trying to go to work. You're not coming back. He said, and if I want to be an effective teacher, I want you to come back. So yes, you're going to be a little sore, but you're going to say, I'm sore for the purpose. Because there's a, this is funny. He he always laughs at me because the uh, the blowers go out at the dojo sometimes, and it's like last in the winter, the heater went out, the heat went mm. out in the back, so he shut the back session down. I said, since they just leave it open, I said, man, Davidson, we didn't even have no heat half the time. And he looked, he says, what did I tell you? He said, you have to evolve with the times. People train for different reasons. He says, and we want you to feel comfortable so that you will learn, so that I can teach you effective martial arts, so that you will train hard, so that you will be able to defend yourself. You can't learn so while you're getting right. frostbite. Yeah. So, and that's what he said. So it's like, you know, in my mind, I'm still, you know, gladiator. But he's, and that's that's why he's sensei, though, because he says, yeah, it's okay when you're younger, you think this way. He says, but every day you've got to elevate your mind. Every day, okay, that worked then. But if I want to take it to the level, level I got to do this and I got to do that. And again, he always says, take the ego out of it, you know, and I've got um, one of my, one of uh, one of the instructors. There's a big plaque on the wall in the back of the dojo. It's got several sayings. But one of them that really strikes me, it says, if you show me once, I may remember it. If you show me again, I may remember it. If you tell me, I may remember it. If you involve me, I will learn it. Mm-hmm. And I'm paraphrasing that, but I, I like that analogy because if I just show you how to do something and just tell you what you should do, yeah, you may blow it. But if I get there with you and explain it and work the move with you and, and you know, oh, and a lot of the times when I, I look on, um, I look at the TikTok videos and I look at the the weird stuff going on and everybody's screaming at everybody, everybody's filming people. You get a five minute video, a five second video of someone yelling. You don't know what came before that. You don't know what came after that. And then everybody's a Karen. Yep. What, a Karen. What? I, okay. Yeah. Racism, it does exist. Trust me. I'm a six foot three black man in Detroit, Michigan. I know what racism is. But my God, I mean, I've experienced it. But at some point, we got to start recognizing that not everybody is racist. Not every black man is a gun carrying cracked out thug you know not every chinese man is 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 a money hungry whatever whatever. but this 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 whole like you said this tiktok algorithm it wants to take the worst bits of people and show it but on the flip side of that i do have to say it is good to expose some of the behaviors that you see but what scares me is it's like where do you draw the balance you know how do you 
How do you find the balance in that? It's good that we can expose a lot of the racism and sexism and classism. But on the other hand, all right, was that really an incident if I don't see the whole incident? Because I guarantee you, if you walked in on me and my wife's conversation sometimes, you would think I was an abused husband. Mm. But you didn't realize what I did before that to respect that. You know what I'm saying? So you didn't get the total pictures. And at that part, you would say, oh, she should have hit you with a skillet. So <laughs> I think we're in a we're in a society of, of quick fixism or let, let me show you this sound bites, they call it. We're in a society of sound bites. And I think that's what's going on with martial arts. We're in karate bites. Mm. You know, let me show you this to formulate your whole opinion. And like and you that, said, and that's why we do what we do here with with longer yeah. form conversation. You know, I, I think the shortest episode we've ever done in an interview was about 45 minutes. You know, here we are, we're, we're a bit over an hour because that's how long we needed to talk to have the to conversation that we wanted to have. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure if we released five minute versions of our episodes, we'd have more listens, but would they actually be of higher quality? Right. I can right. go to more shorter martial arts classes and count and check boxes. You know, I went to 75 classes last week. But did I get as much out of it as one 90-minute class? Did I actually benefit? Did I progress? Yeah. I can do three techniques, but did I learn as much as if I did a full kata? You know? So, I don't know, man. Like I said, this, this whole, you know, martial arts is a way of life for a lot of people, me included. And I guess I just want everyone to always keep an open mind in terms of the benefit of it. But most of, I want my fellow martial artists, and when I say martial art, I don't just mean karate. I mean, to me, martial means war. So any art, any form practice that is, you know, that is a military base, a warring base, a fighting, I call it martial. If we could all just like come down off of this, who's better, who's the best, and it just starts saying, we're all great, but we all can learn more. I think that the TikTok platform is an amazing place. It has the potential to be an amazing place. You got an app that you have someone get up and do this intricate dance and 50 million people will copy this dance and it's fun and it's positive. So why can't you do the same thing with if martial artists, instead of negative trolls and all of that crap, just show a good, simple way to move your arm and just do it. Get 50 million people doing that right and then follow it up with a good, you know, stuff like that. If we could just turn this platform, get the venom out of it, maybe we could switch the algorithm. If the algorithm says, oh, hey, the positive stuff is actually doing pretty good. But is that what the world wants? You know? I I wish the answer was yes. I don't, sadly, I don't think so. Uh, We're living in the Matrix, in case you didn't know. (laughs) We're, (laughs) We're in the Matrix. For sure. There's a glitch in it. So it's a couple of glitches. Yeah. If if people want to follow you, where do they go? Your music, um, your your TikTok yeah, think, account, all it? that. Uh Sensei Gully or just Art Gully Jr. Mm-hmm. Um I, I have an Instagram account, but I do not post it and I do not check it. Mm-hmm. I don't do anything else because social media is it's a lot. Yeah. So I like the Instagram. I have a YouTube channel. The link is in my you know what? The link is in my in my um TikTok account. Okay. And oh this I have to get out. Please, people, the link to all my music. I'm on all platforms. Just Google Art Gully Jr. And I'm on everything. You know, I do basic um, uh, jazz, techno, couple of raps. I'm very, I'm not profane. Check out that music because I got to keep paying for these kids college. And, you know, <laughs> 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 but I will say this, my revenue stream, I, when I, I check my revenues, it's so weird. My, my residuals now, my royalties are coming in from TikTok because yeah. other users are using my songs. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's kind of neat. So all my music is on. If you if you put Art Gully Jr. in sound, all my songs pop up. So that's great. But basically so it's time to it. produce some music specifically for TikTok. Well, TikTok, if you're listening. <laughs> no, I, cool. I, 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 no, I think you can do like, because um, what is it? It's got to be like two. Most of the platforms want two minutes. Two to three minutes. Yeah. Two, yeah. And then, you know, just kind of front load stuff that martial artists could use. And well, that's what it is. Drop a challenge tied into that tune. 
Yeah, I'm gonna, you know, that's a good idea. I did a song, one song. It's it's actually about it's called The Basics. And it's so cool because um Master Adams allowed me to tape him and uh his wife, who she's also a master, another one of my masters, Melvin Early, they are all, you know, talking on the song. And I, I was like, I was so geeked. And I always put it out there with Mark. That's a good thing. I say, hey, show me your basics and put this. I should do that. That's a very totally, good idea. Man. Just to see other people's base. I want to learn more stuff from people. I love picking up information because what I do is when I see something, I go right to sense that. I say, I was saying this the other day. What do you think about that? Sometimes he says, oh, yeah. Sometimes he's like, stop watching that. <laughs> so, <laughs> But yeah, that would be a good thing. But um, yeah, just art. I'm on TikTok, Art Gully Jr. Or, or I think it's at Sensei Gully. I don't know if there's a dash in between that. You know, it's like you don't know your I'll own you, phone I'll number. I'll tell you what. I'll look it up right now. Wait, are we looking up on TikTok? We, we can. <laughs> we can. Let me let me make sure I turn this turn mute it before I open it up. Uh, where are you? Let me see. I've got the Sensei oh, underscore yeah. Gully. Yep, at Sensei underscore Gully. Yeah. And you'll see my picture because I'm doing this. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm looking through the keyhole. I'm always, always eager to learn more stuff. And if you if if sometimes if you look too much, if your eyes are too wide, you're missing the smaller points in life. So sometimes you got to focus it down. That's why I'm doing that. But um, I have to say that, um, again, I, I'm overwhelmed that you even wanted to talk to me on any subject, and I really yeah, appreciate this, man. Course. This was great. This was fun. And, um, we had a good time. Well, I, if, I, if it's okay, I want to give a couple of shout outs. If yeah, it's okay, please, do right, it. first and foremost, because the only reason I'm here, I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. Okay, first and foremost, you know my sensei, Grandmaster Willie Adams, and Grandmaster uh, Eugene Woods, Master Reggie Phillips, Master Bird Maben, Master Carl Maben. I'm um, excuse me, Master Carl Martin, Master Michael Schaefer, Master Melvin Early. These are guys, just a few who've shaped me, you know, uh, Master Janine Adams, you know, I want to say thanks to you guys, my family of always, my wife, my three boys. I won't mention their names because they don't really like social media, me putting sure. them out there. All my crew at my job where I work at the plant, you know, as I always say, the house of pain that Christ have built. Uh, big shout out to them, to my boss who gave me the day off so I could do this. Oh, Ms. Brenda. Wow. Oh, Thank you. Awesome. And to my main man, Aziz, he's um, one of the gentlemen, and I, he's like a mentor to me. And I told him today, he said, did you do this? Are you ready? I said, I'm so nervous. He said, just be yourself. You'll be all right. So yeah. to everyone who's shaped me, I want to say thank you. And I'm a work in progress. We're all work in progress. Don't ever be afraid to try anything. Don't ever be afraid to say that you don't know. And don't ever be afraid to stop learning. Please, people. Train hard, train safe, and everybody be good. Jeremy, thank you so much for this opportunity, sir. I hope you enjoyed that episode. I had a great time finally getting to have a back and forth conversation with Art. Man, thanks for coming on the show. Lots of fun. I know this isn't the last time we're going to chat. And heck, maybe we can collaborate on some content at some point in the future. Hey, listeners, did you dig that? Do you want to do something to help us out? Leave a review or share an episode or buy a book or a shirt or whatever. Don't forget, we've also got training programs at whistlekick.com. And you can even bring me in for a seminar. If that's of interest, reach out jeremy at whistlekick.com. If you have suggestions for topics or guests, let us know about them. Our social media is at whistlekick. And that's all we've got for now. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.